Hello and welcome to this Philips Volcano webinar in collaboration with Radcliffe Cardiology and Interventional Cardiology Review. I'm Dr. Christopher Cook, Clinical Editor for the Radcliffe webinar series, and I'm delighted to be joined live by Professor Gerald Werner from the Klinikum Darmstadt in Germany. Professor Werner is going to be talking to us today about the use of intravascular ultrasound in the assessment of chronic total occlusions. With an ever-aging population, more and more complex forms of coronary artery disease are presenting to the catheter lab for treatment. Often combining challenging anatomy with complex calcification, CTO intervention requires advanced PCI techniques and strategies to achieve procedural success. Despite an extensive disease burden, difficulties in vessel sizing and wire tracking, the use of IVUS in CTO remains staggeringly low. During this webinar, Professor Werner will familiarize us with the procedural algorithms that are designed to maximize successful CTO recanalization. We will also learn some of the techniques he uses to treat this important group of patients. In particular, we will hear how IVUS can be incorporated into all stages of the CTO PCI procedure, including both antegrade and retrograde approaches. Now, before we begin, just a quick note to our audience, you'll have the opportunity to ask Professor Werner questions via the text box on your screen throughout the course of the webinar, and Professor Werner will answer as many as possible at the end. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking now and hand over to Professor Werner to begin his presentation. I'm Professor Gerald Werner from the Klinikum Darmstadt in Germany. I'm an interventional cardiologist with an interest in intravascular ultrasound and coronary intervention over the past 25 years. And I want to present some information and insights into the use of intravascular ultrasound in the specific setting of chronic total occlusions. These are my conflicts. I'm giving talks and uh, discussions with most of the companies that are involved in complex CTO PCI. The overview uh, of this seminar is that first I want to explain what is a CTO in the context of interventional therapy, then discuss the possible role of IVUS to improve the outcome in this specific setting of coronary lesions, outline the use of IVUS in the anti-grade approach and in the retrograde approach, and specifically also talk about IVUS for stent placement in these often very diffusely diseased chronically occluded arteries. And finally, we want to discuss the evidence that is based on uh, trials published on the use of intravascular ultrasound in the context of chronic total occlusions or complex PCI. Well, chronic total occlusion sounds like a niche of interventional therapy. It is defined as 100% occlusion without any flow antigradely through this lesion with a duration of at least three months. But it is not a niche. It's not uh, a small uh, part of the coronary spectrum. It is, in fact, now well established that about 20% of all patients with coronary artery disease, in fact, have a CTO as one of their major lesions. Unfortunately, these patients are often excluded from undergoing PCI because of the complexity of the intervention. It is more challenging than regular PCI. Historically, we know that CTO PCI had a lower procedural success rate, was burdened by increased restenosis, and specifically also reocclusion in the area, for, especially of the bare metal stent use. The technical challenges include the passage of the guide wire and then subsequently, subsequently the balloon catheter across the lesion to enable the successful PCI and then finally the placement of stents. The issue is still uh, under discussion whether this will relate into a short and especially long-term patency. The effective wiring technique is the key to success in PCI 
uh, of chronic occlusions. And here we have a very steep improvement in technical success. While historically we would talk about a success rate of 60% maybe uh, 10 years ago, now we can safely say that in expert hands you would expect a success rate in even very complex coronary CTO patients of 90% in plus. And that is due to improved anti-grade wire escalation techniques, parallel wiring, dissection re-entry technique, and especially the retrograde transcollateral approach. Patients with CTOs are still referred to bypass surgery as this mentioned techniques have not yet been accepted widely by the interventional community. So most of the patients still on an epidemiologic view are going either to medical therapy or to surgery but not to PCI. And we want to increase the awareness of the potential of uh, PCI for CTO, and especially the improved technology that we have at hand, which is also relying on imaging techniques. The indication for a PCI for CTO is based on the symptoms of the patient. We often achieve an improved exercise tolerance. There are a lot of data showing that opening a CTO improves left ventricular function. And there are data based on registries that there might also be an improvement in mortality. But symptom relief is the priority uh, that is on the list uh, when we discuss CTO PCI with a patient. Now, where comes intravascular ultrasound into play? Of course, the intervention is based on angiographic viewing. However, angiography, we all know that, is a two-dimensional image. And it only shows the contrast-filled lumen and doesn't actually uh, always accurately allow assessment of the plaque. Ivis, Ivis provides, on the other hand, cross-sectional images. So we can really discriminate between the luminal and the plaque area and the whole volume of the vessel. We can also assess negative and positive remodeling. In the context of a chronically occluded artery, IVAS specifically allows to understand anatomical structures of the vessel within the CTO, so where we don't have perfect or contrast filling at all, and we can understand where the wire position is in relation to the anatomy of the CTO. We can assess the proximal occlusion cap, but we can also assess the progress of the wire during the CTO procedure. So we have both the anti-grade and also the retrograde use of IVAS uh, in this uh, setting. IVAS will help identify the course or position of a retrograde wire after opening the occluded artery. And then, of course, it is important to assess the final dimension of the distal vessel, which is often underestimated by angiography alone. And the sizing of the stents can then be based on IVAS instead of angiography, which would otherwise lead to underexpansion. So let's first focus on the passage of the guide wire as the basic and most important and difficult step in CTO PCI. Of course, we can establish the position of the guide wire if we are able to advance the IVAS into a parallel situation. This is often possible, and we'll discuss some of these cases. But to start a CTO, it's often very difficult to assess from angiography the actual proximal cap uh, anatomy. Often the proximal start of a CTO is located where a side branch is taking off and we don't really see a stump. So IVAS can identify this entry point into the CTO. And when we follow then the guide wire into the CTO and the IVAS can follow, the IVAS will identify whether the wire is really 
in the intimal or in the subintimal space and can then allow to further plan the procedural technique to get back from the subintimal into the intimal position. A second wire can then be advanced alongside the IVUS catheter to manipulate under live IVUS viewing. And I will not talk about uh, alternative techniques like OCT, but uh, I just want to mention here that the live imaging of the wire positioning by IVUS is the main advantage, of course, with limited uh, resolution as compared to OCT, but with the option of a real live visualization of the wire progress. So we will first talk about the wiring technique in these proximal uh, cap situations. Of course, the ideal situation is when the proximal cap and the side branch are at relatively shallow angles. And then we can advance the wire into the side branch relative to the parent vessel and allow the cross-sectional imaging while withdrawing the IVUS catheter from the side branch into the main cross-sectional section. The second main topic will be to guide the complex retrograde approach where the wire is advanced from the collateral position into the distal artery and then further advanced towards the anti-grade wire position. And often we cannot make a connection between the anti-grade and the retrograde wire because of massive black and we don't know which wire is in the correct position. So this will help to identify whether the wire is in the intimal or subintimal space. And then allows the advancement and positioning of the retrograde wire into the right spot. Again, here we have the uh, opportunity to do live imaging of the wire manipulation. The first uh, case that I want to use as an example will focus on identifying the proximal cap, the IVUS guided penetration. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the side branch angle should not be more than 90 degrees. Otherwise, it will be difficult to visualize from the side branch actually the proximal cap. The major inf information to be obtained by imaging will be the location of the cap the structure of the cap regarding calcification, or on the other hand, soft tissue. And this helps us decide the wire uh, strengths and also tells us the size of the distal target. So either we can use IVUS with a direct online guidance, then we need uh, a big catheter like an eight French catheter, where we leave the probe in the side branch right at the spot of, uh, to visualize the stump. And then we can come with a second wire and a microcatheter, pass this IVUS catheter and try under visualization the entry into the, prox into the stump of the occlusion. If you don't have so much space, we will do the entry, the penetration uh, of the proximal stump and use IVUS afterwards to confirm the position. The use of IVUS for stumpless lesions is highly recommended and may prevent subintimal entry due to the wrong identification of the CTO stem. So this is a case where we can see a typical occlusion of the right coronary with a side branch. At the proximal cap, we do a contralateral injection to visualize the distal segment of the artery. And here we can see that the proximal entry into the occlusion is actually unclear. So it's somewhere here around and we have a large side branch. So either here or here is the entry. If we just puncture without visualization, there's a high risk that we lose the luminal position. On the other hand, we see that there is some filling of contrast in the course of the vessel. So actually the occlusion is shorter than we think. It's highly important to identify the right entry. So this was uh, 
JCTO score three, three, uh, two patient because there is no identifiable stump and the occlusion length was assessed to be more than 20 millimeters. Not a, a lot of calcium and the patient had not been tried before and there is a straight course of the vessel. This is a decision tree that I would suggest to use in this situation of uh, anti-grade approach. If the proximal cap is ambiguous, like in this position, and we have a side branch at the cap, then we would advise to use IVUS guided penetration. If there would not be a side branch, then interventional collaterals, the presence of interventional collaterals would allow the retrograde approach. If there is no option for a retrograde approach, then we probably have to uh, go to a sub intimal dissection approach using, for example, the Stingray reentry catheter. We want to avoid retrograde approach whenever possible because we know that the retrograde approach has a slightly higher complication rate. So if we can stay in the anti-grade setup with an IVUS guided pen penetration, we also shorten the procedure, limit resources, and play a safer game. So IVUS guided penetration would aim at getting the anti-grade wire into the intima or, the, or sub intimal space and achieve an anti-grade passage. If the anti-grade wire escalation into a non-ambiguous cap will lead into a sub intimal space, then of course, we could use IVUS again, and I will have a second example to highlight this. So let's come back to this case. We have at once an IVUS. It's not shown here on the still images, but here you see the IVUS pulled back from the side branch. And soon at three o'clock, we see the main body of the RCA. And we see this is the delineation of the proximal cap. And now we pull back and we see that the proximal RCA is severely diseased. So we already know from this image that we have to treat the RCA also in this segment until the osteo. Let's go step by step. So this is the pullback from the side branch. Then we are just here with a probe imaging the beginning of the pro uh, of the actual right coronary, and this is in the proximal diffuse atherosclerotic right coronary. Again, to delineate our target, so we want to hit this target right in the middle, and we know that there is no calcification, so we don't need a very strong wire. We will use a middle, a middle sized or middle strength wire, like in this setting here. We have the IVIS probe, live imaging, we have the wire mounted on a microcatheter. Here you see the tip of the microcatheter, a fine cross. And the wire of choice here was a Gaia 2. And you see the actual fluoroscopy of the penetration process. And now the wire is advanced. Of course, we don't want to advance it too far. We just want to uh, advance it so far that we can clarify by IVUS where is actually the position. Now I will show you by advancing the IVUS from proximal to distal, the course of the wire. We'll go back step by step. Here is the wire. We are proximal to the cap. Then I advance the probe and you see the wire going right there in the middle. Of course, we cannot follow the course because the IVUS goes into the side branch. But what is very important, we know we are in the middle of the proximal cap. Here, the still image should highlight while advancing the wire. And it's important to identify, of course, the reflection of a guide wire. It can be mistaken with calcium, but it has a very typical shadow, a white shadow, and here we advance the probe, and here you see following the Gaia wire into the central body. Subsequently, so we achieve here the IVUS guided penetration. We are not subintimal, so 
actually we bypass the SF intimal section and go to the anti-grade wire passage. Here you see we advance the fine cross, we switch to a soft wire, and then it was possible to advance the wire all the way to the distal artery and an art, uh, a lesion that look, looked to be very complex turned out to be done with this relatively straightforward and great approach. Of course, important to confirm the position of the wire by contralateral injection, we did also a second plane and confirmed that this wire is really true lumen in the distal part, and then we could do stenting. But as we already saw in this case, it was diffuse disease. Here is another suggestion of a decision tree in case we are thinking of using IBIS to optimize stent selection in CTOs. If you have a focal CTO, of course, there will be no discussion. We know a proximal vessel size. We would know the distal vessel size. We can judge the length of the stent and do integrate ballooning and stenting. But in off, off, often it is the case that we face these diffusely diseased patients. And then IBIS should be used to uh, optimize stent sizing and also to discriminate the black load and especially where is positive and where is negative remodeling. After stenting, we can also then optimize the expansion, apposition, and extension of the stent, especially when we have calcified lesion. So let's come back to this example. This was the result after the first balloon inflations with the 2.5 balloon. And you can imagine that this is really disease from top to bottom. So we want to find out where is the healthy segment. So we, we advance the IVUS into the distal RCA and the PDA. And now we pull back from the PDA towards the cracks and towards the proximal RCA. So first information we want to gather is, is the cracks disease free? And we see a lot of plaque. So, but it looked like, I go back, that the entrance of the PL branch here is actually free of plaque. So, most probably, we might get away with just putting a stent into one direction and keeping the other branch open without need for a second stent. And here you see the pullback. We assess the vessel size, one, two, three, at least three, probably 3.5 millimeters, a lot of calcification. And you see the wire, uh, the wire position is all luminal, all in the true lumen. It's in the central uh, segment. And now we will pull back and soon we'll probably uh, get to the proximal side branch. This was the side branch. Let's catch this. You see the wire is still in the side branch. So this was actually the proximal cap. And we hit the proximal cap right in the center. And here the side branch is coming. You see the wire at nine o'clock. And now it's here. It's all in the same space. And we know we have to do here four millimeters stent in the proximal RCA. So this is the still frame showing the diffuse disease, but also the information that actually the ostium of the PL branch is free. So what we decided was here to do stenting towards only one branch. And we choose the PL branch as the main target. So we switch the wire into the PL branch, remove the red grade wire, and cross over the, uh, the PDA. This is the diffuse disease that is documented. I was to guide the procedure. And this is the final result here. After a lot of stents inflated up to four millimeter, which you might not dare to do if you would not have the information by IVUS. An excellent result. Side branches all maintained open and uh, ensures the optimum 
an intermediate result. And here we expect positive remodeling after the establishment of the coronary flow. And here the IVUS pulled back to confirm that there is good expansion and apposition of the stent. Here we are already in the distal RCA. We have some eccentric calcification. Of course, then the symmetry, symmetry of the stent expansion is not always possible, but it's, uh, the lumen is very satisfactory. And we pull back to the proximal RCA. And then, of course, try to establish also the perfect position and placement of the osteal stent. So this, uh, we have to remove the catheter a little bit into the aorta. And here we see that the stent is perfectly placed. Let's, here we are in the ostium of, at the aortic level and at once, and we see that the stent is perfect, not protruding in the aorta, and proper sized the whole part of the ostium. This is the initial image and the final image. And a complex RCA CTO made easy by IVAS guided cap penetration with true lumen passage and preservation of all the side branches. So re establishing reconstruction of the true anatomy. So this is the summary, as I already mentioned, it demonstrates that we can really identify the correct wire position and make a procedure with a luminal approach and a true lumen passage possible. And I think what was very impressive here was this severe diffuse disease from top to bottom, from proximal to distal, and that uh, the sizing of the stent would probably be much smaller than we finally ended up. Of course, we would start with a small stent because we don't want to create dissection into the regular segments distal to the occlusion. And we started with smaller stents, but under IVIS guidance, we went up to 3.5 millimeter in the distal RCA and four millimeter in the proximal RCA. The Practical use of IVUS is not related only to, of course, identifying that you are in the luminal position, but more often it happens that you get into the subintimal position. And then it is important to identify where is the crossing over from the true lumen into the subintimal space and how can we correct this. There are basically two situations in a suspected subintimal wire position. First, you can use IVUS to confirm where is the luminal and subintimal space. It's easy to do when there is a great volume of plaque, but if the wire is subintimal in a very narrow vessel segment where there is no atherosclerosis, it's often difficult to identify the possible intimal space because it may be pressed against the wall and almost invisible. Even most experienced CTO operators using IVUS sometimes are mistaken by identifying the true lumen and uh, subintimal position when there is not much black. To identify the position, it's required to perform a slow and careful pullback and really look minute, uh, millimeter per millimeter with several manual forward and backward movements, whether you are really luminal or true lum uh, or subintimal. And once you have identified where you are, you can use this information for a guided entry with a second wire. To perform this successful re-entry, you need a second, often very stiff wire which is at once parallel to the wire on which you have mounted the IVUS. The second wire is always supported by a microcatheter. And ideally, you find a puncture site where there is not much calcium in the plaque 
into the true lumen. The more proximal you achieve this, the less extended is, of course, the subintimal space. And proximal is often easier because there is the biggest target for the penetration. You can monitor this again live on the IVIS probe in parallel position. And once you achieve this entry with this very stiff wire, you advance the microcatheter and try to immediately replace it with a soft wire. And if you are really in the true lumen, then the soft wire will invariably adv be advanced very easily through the space of the true lumen into the distal artery. And then you can also advance the IVUS and identify the wire position uh, there. And in fact, I have an example here from last week because it's not so rare that these uh, things happen. Actually, if you look at this anatomy of the CTO of the LED, you see it's an ambiguous cap. However, you see a lot of disease in this diagonal branch. So this prevented originally to put the IVUS probe into this diagonal branch for an IVUS guided entry. So we had to uh, do a direct puncture without IVUS imaging, hoping to hit the true lumen. But you can identify here, I think, some calcium shadow. And here you see on the right, uh, right catheter, uh, on the right image, the right hand image, that we already advanced the wire, and the wire is clearly hitting the subintimal space, at least here. It's clearly outside of the contrast filled lumen. So the specific problem of this patient was that the major collateral supply was wire septal branch from the proximal LED to the distal LED. So we put a microcatheter here to do selective imaging and injection to identify the position. We used several methods. We tried uh, also to go retrograde through the septal branch, but it was not possible for me to advance the wire. Then we tried to put a reentry catheter on this position because it looked ideal, but the calcium uh, prevented that the reentry wire could be manipulated into the true lumen. So before you give up this position, you should be uh, looking for an alternative. And the alternative will be to identify where is the problem. Is it proximal or distal? So in fact, we did some balloon dilatation with a small balloon to enable to get the IVUS probe forward. And here you see the IVUS in the wrong space. Here is black, and here is the IVUS probe outside. So a typical eccentric position. Here you see the round lumen with a calcium plaque, and the IVUS squeezed into this fall space. And we pull back the probe proximal. And here, we are in the true domain. So this is actually the proximal LED, again, severely calcified. So let's go forward again on this recording and try to identify where we lost the true lumen. This is the side branch. This is the diagonal branch here coming. And immediately here at the proximal cap, obviously, we went subintimal. So here it will be a little bit difficult maybe to re-enter. So this was the position I chose here. This is a big target to re-enter. So I put a wire parallel to this IVUS probe. You see here the force and the true lumen. This was the big target, the true lumen. I put a wire parallel, and here you see now, after puncturing, the wire beyond this calcium in this space. It's a little bit difficult to see, but here you see the uh, typical reflection of the ibis, uh, of the wire in the ibis. To make it easier, we will do this again. I will make it manually.
So on the right hand side at uh, two o'clock, we see the target. The calcium prevents a little bit the imaging, but it was not so dense that I couldn't see the reflection of the wire here. Here again, the typical reflection of the wire that has obviously hit the right spot. Here again, advancing the, the probe, uh, uh, I must say pulling back the probe and confirming that at least we are here behind the black wall in the true lumen. You he see here the different positions highlighted on these still images. So this was a situation where anti-grade wire escalation led to a subintimal wire position. And then we had the option to do an IBIS guided entry. We had interventional collaterals, but I couldn't use them as I had mentioned. So there was no option for a retrograde approach. So the alternative was subintimal dissection reentry, which didn't work. I used this as the first option. And then the second option was IVIS guided reentry, which in this case worked. You see here the original false wire position and here now the true wire position, the microcatheter is advanced and after retrieving blood from the distal port, we inject it to just highlight where is the vessel course and then advance the dilatation. And here you see that, of course, it's a diffusely diseased artery, but we could perfectly put stents. And actually, we put here a two stent strategy because of the severe disease also in the circumflex, uh, in the diagonal branch. So this is an example of a very complex uh, CTO of the LED that demonstrates the use of IVIS for identifying the subintimal wire position and the potential location of a re-entry spot into the true lumen as close as possible to the proximal uh, cap. And once the microcatheter was positioned parallel to the IVIS, a stiff recanalization wire was advanced towards the true lumen as identified on IVIS. And under continuous IVIS vision, the wire tip position was confirmed inside the true lumen. And then we could advance the microcatheter into the true lumen and then with a soft wire, follow it all the way through. The final challenging case is uh, dealing with the retrograde approach. The retrograde approach has been developed over the past five to 10 years, refined in the last five years, and has been increasingly popular among CTO specialists. About one third of all procedures nowadays are done in expert centers by the retrograde approach. It includes the passage of a collateral and typically advancing a wire into the distal part of the CTO. But the advancement of the retrograde wire into the proximal part of the CTO and into the proximal vessel is not always easy. And here is when typically IVUS can help in this retrograde approach, especially for clarification. Why does the retrograde wire cannot be advanced any further? Of course, IVUS cannot be advanced through the collaterals, so we always put the IVUS on the anti-grade wire. But the anti-grade wire, of course, will visualize the position of the retrograde wire when we achieve a parallel positioning of both wires. When the retrograde wire is in a dissection or in a severe plaque, uh, we can correct these problems by adopting the technique according to the IVUS information. It's very important to recognize the relative position of the anti-grade and retrograde wires within the CTO body. Either of them can be intimal or subintimal, or they can be both intimal or both subintimal. But you don't realize from angiography. And specifically, we actually avoid any contrast injection once we work in this uh, mode of uh, technical approach, because any contrast can extend dissections 
and make the procedure more complicated. So usually we will predilate on the anti-grade wire with a balloon about two to five millimeter to make space for the ivus and then advance the ivus into the CTO body. Sometimes the short tipped ivus probes are advantageous as the lead into the occlusion may be limited. On the other hand, short tips are a little bit more blunt, so there are also downsides. Now, IVAS will render the information to analyze the problem, why we cannot further connect the anti-grade and the retrograde wire space. Could be due to heavy calcification or simply that we haven't created enough space for the reverse cart dilatation. It's also important, in, especially in long CTOs, to identify the appropriate position within the CTO vessel where to create the connection, specifically outside calcifications and ideally within the body of the CTO. You want to avoid long subintimal segments. You want to limit the subintimal part of the reverse card maneuver to the minimum. But in severe calcifications, this is not always possible. So this is um, adopted from uh, Dr. Sumitsuchi's uh, paper on the principles of connecting wires in the setting of the red crate reverse cart maneuver. You have uh, the CTO body and you have the proximal and the distal lumen. And the wire will enter into the proximal part of the CTO and the retrograde wire into the distal part of the CTO. And then you will have the intimal space and the subintimal space. And Iris can tell you which of these wires is where. Could be either this position, this position, or this position. All three settings will finally lead to a connection of the wires and a successful procedure once you identify the situation. So this is a decision tree to decide when IVAS should be used in the red grade approach. If the red grade and the anti-grade wire connects overlaps, then of course we will proceed and try to get the red grade wire into the anti-grade guide, externalize with an externalization wire and then do anti-grade ballooning and stenting. But whenever we hit some problems, either the wires don't overlap, then we of course need to improve the anti-grade wire position. And then we're in a situation like uh, we discussed with the anti-grade approach. You need to identify where is the true lumen or the actual vessel lumen and get the anti-grade wire in the correct position. Are we reaching the main branch or are we in the side branch to advance the wire parallel to the red grade wire? If the wires overlap, but we still cannot move the red grade wire towards the anti grade guide, then there might be calcium. We might have uh, problems with the connection zone. We might move, have to move the connection zone proximal or distal. Or we simply are faced with a very big vessel where we are lost with our wires, kind of, and we might decide to use something like a guide liner or a guide extension to facilitate the connection of the both wires. All this information can be derived from IVAS. Let's have a look at this example. This is a CTO, again, of the right coronary. Again, a very diffuse diseased artery with a lesion here, but actually the CTO is here. So the lesion is just a problem on the way to the CTO, but here you see the CTO is here actually. And we see from the red grade filling that we have distal filling at the crux. There seems to be a terra incognita in between. So these are typical lesions where probably only the retrograde approach will be successful. Again, JCTO score would be two. If this actually was a reattempt, it's a little bit tapered entry, but it's a very long CTO. So that is why it is a JCTO score two. Here is a tapered entry, but then we don't know 
where is the course of the vessel. So we do first, of course, an integrated approach to position also the wire, but the wire actually doesn't go into the right coronary, but it stays into a side branch. Once we cannot correct this, we leave this in a position and try to get to the retrograde approach. So anti-grade wire escalation does not work, but we have interventional collaterals and therefore we use the retrograde approach here. This is the situation highlighting the options for the retrograde approach. Uh, we must uh, know that this patient had undergone a previous PCI of the LED and you see the shade of the stents here crossing over also the septals. But this is actually not a problem if the stent is well expanded. Here we have advanced the microcatheter through the stent struts and identify one of the possible connections here. There is some tortuosity, but there might be also connections here rather straight down towards the PDA. So we advance the next is the actual fluoro sequence of advancing a C on wire over this microcatheter. Try to guide through the collateral using the reference image that is on the fluoro system, on the, on the radiography system. And here you see the actual advancement of a retrograde transcollateral approach. Wire runs smoothly. We try to see for the least resistance. We don't want to have buckling of the wire. If the wire buckles, we hit the wire card. But if it goes straight like here, and we can be confident that we are in a small minuscule collateral diameter. And here actually the tip of the wire goes towards the apex. This needs to be confirmed where we are. So we go into the lateral view and we see that actually the wire should go in this direction. So we correct it and get into the distal RCA. So this is half of the game, but now we need to make the connection. And actually to make the connection here was very difficult. You see the wire are almost touching, but only almost. There is a resistance. So we will try to get the wire in parallel. We have inflated a balloon, but we couldn't make the connection. Now you can try a lot of time and uh, waste a lot of procedure time by trying to make the connection, or you try to understand what is the real problem. You see here, I have already put a balloon in the integrate uh, system and I have dilated enough to get the IVUS probe here. And you see that I try a lot to make the connection. And we will uh, show now the IVUS and the IVUS imaging to understand the situation. So here, the wires are overlapping, but I cannot make the connection to get back into the retrograde uh, situation where the retrograde wire can then advance, be advanced into the anti-grade uh, artery. What is the problem? Let's look at the IVUS. This is a pullback from the side branch where the anti-grade wire ended up. And here at two o'clock, three o'clock, we have the actual distal artery and we pull back and here we see the wire. So the wire enters into the subintimal space, the red grade wire, all subintimal. It already, by the manipulations you saw on the fluoro image, I already created some subintimal space, some kind of hematoma. Well, the proximal artery looks quite good. Let's go back here. Where is the wire actually come? The wire is here. We need to use still images to identify the wire position. Now the wire is a little bit 
in between this calcium shadows here. Here you see the, the typical uh, shape of a wire, the ibis appearance of the wire. So it's, it comes from the distal artery, but it is then entering the proximal artery into the subintimal space. It's here, there is the lumen, and there is the wire. And now it, uh, instead of getting into the lumen, it deviates into the subintimal space and stays here and cannot re-enter into the lumen. So once I identify the problem that we need to get into the true lumen at this spot here, I can correct the problem. You see the situation here? This is the guide wire, uh, the IBIS position. You see the distal RCA and you see the guide wire here. And I advance it further. And this is actually the true lumen. The guide wire is probably here already subintimal situation. There are another uh, situations where IBIS in the retrograde approach is very essential. I don't have an example for this here uh, prepared, but uh, I just want to uh, mention it. It's a typical situation, for example, of an osteal occlusion at the site of the left main, for example, an uh, osteal LED occlusion. And the retrograde wire will be advanced through the right coronary artery, through the collateral, into the mid LED and towards the proximal LED. But there is a high risk that the red grade wire may enter the subintimal space and cause a dissection that may extend even towards the left main artery. In such a situation, a setup as described for the anti grade approach with an ambiguous cap is needed. The IVUS probe is positioned again in a side branch or maybe the circumflex or a diagonal branch close to this osteal occlusion to visualize where the retrograde wire enters into the proximal lumen. Of course, this cannot be used in the right coronary artery because there we don't have an antiquate access. But again, it's very important before you put stents to verify that the uh, wire position is really luminal and not uh, subintimal at an osteal location. Whenever in doubt, whether the retrograde wire entered the aorta outside of the actual lumen or even the ostium, an anti-grade ibis is important after a pre-dilatation with a small balloon to avoid stent placement outside the arterial structure. And now let's come back to this uh, last retrograde case uh, where we have dilation again, dilated, and then we face again a very diffusely diseased artery. I show you the plaque load that we identify, especially here, in the proximal RCA segment. Proximal, we are uh, in the distal RCA segment. Proximal, we had little disease, as you had shown, uh, we had shown by the Ivis pullback. But around the crux cordis, there is uh, some work to be done. And Ivis helps us identify. And actually, in this situation, we uh, went retrograde through the PDA and the PL branch here is actually occluded. We can't see it because the occlusion is right at the crux. And proximal, we pull back, we see diffuse disease here, a little bit eccentric black. Then here we have the position where the retrograde wire was first subintimal and then gets back into the intimal position. So here we have a short segment of subintimal space. Here you see the true lumen, and here you see the subintimal space. And when we put stents, first I left the crux free because I wanted to decide what to do about the crux. And we inject here. And only then we can uh, see after re uh, gathering or recapturing the side branch by another wire that we need to do some more work on the prox uh, distal artery. And we decided based on IVUS in this situation, 
to do a two stand strategy actually and put uh, two stands one in the PL branch, one into the PD branch and achieve a very good result. And you see the red grade filling of the collateral that we had used with a microcatheter. So this case in summary shows a complex RCA CTO with problems in performing the reverse card maneuver that is demonstrated by Ivan and I was identified the position of the retrograde wire relative to the anti-grade wire. The retrograde wire could then be steered into the proximal true lumen under live IVAS imaging and fluoroscopy. So IVAS helped identify the need also then further on for bifurcation treatment at the crux by showing massive black load of the PL branch ostium. Now, this was a lot of uh, practical examples and, of course, intuitively nice results after stenting. But actually, what is the de actually published data on the long-term benefit of such an approach of IBIS-guided placement of stents? Most experts who use IBIS would agree that it improves quality of outcome. However, it has been not shown especially by a lack of appropriately powered randomized trials to provide really robust evidence of, of benefits of IVUS guided PCI. Current European guidelines recommend the use of IVUS in PCI for all patients undergoing stent implantation, but it's only class 2A and level B. And in fact, it's, although CTOs are very complex cases, IVUS is only used in a minority of cases. We did an analysis of the European CTO registry in the year 2011, and IVUS was only used in a ridiculous low number of 3% of cases. I have an update of this registry now, and I know that the number of cases has just been increased to about 12 to 14%. It is more often used in the red grade approach, about one-fourth of all retrograde procedures involve IVUS, but it's still a very low number. We know that these case reports that I show and many others published describe that the advancement of the IVUS catheter helps in uh, advancing the procedure, making it easier to identify true lumen, helps you visualize the true lumen, but the real use of IVUS in a systematic approach has only been tested in very small series. There is some information from 39 patients in a paper by Park from Korea that IVUS guided wiring was useful and safe, but it's not really compared to non IVUS guided wiring regarding procedural uh, time and wiring time. It was shown that. Uh, there is a high success rate of IVUS guided reverse CART approach in CTO recognition, like I showed you uh, an example again. Uh, this is a study from uh, Rator, where he analyzed the data from a Japanese CTO center. But it's small centers, small series, and actually it's not a randomized comparison. There is also some concern that IVUS use might complicate the procedure and uh, may even prolong the procedure because you need to prepare the lesion to advance IVUS. But actually, there is no uh, consistent information that IVUS use really relates in actual complications. So we have limited data on uh, in a randomized fashion that the examples that I showed you could not have been managed in another way, even though intuitively we would say we had no other choice and it made procedures really easier and successful. But you need a, a bigger number of cases in a randomized fashion to really study this. And as many of the CTO lesions are not, uh, one is never like the other, it's very difficult to find a randomizable population. Of course, I also showed that IVUS use after opening the CTO has some potential. 
So after stent placement, we achieve bigger lumens, which we wouldn't have dared to achieve when we wouldn't have been on the safe side by getting the IVIS information of the true vessel size. But this also has not been shown. Larger trials are not av uh, available and the available trials are often underpowered to really determine the impact of IVIS. However, there is some data uh, on the horizon and I hope that this inspires more data to come. So let me just show you uh, two of these studies. The one was the AVIO trial uh, inspired by Dr. Colombo, which did not limit itself to CTOs, but it included CTO patients. IVIS guidance showed in this uh, trial slightly significant advantage in less major cardiac events up to 24 months. But 48 percent of the patients did not meet the pre-specified IVIS guidance criteria. And a subgroup analysis showed a significant difference in terms of the final minimum, minimum luminal diameter between both groups. But again, we don't know whether this will impact the long-term patency. In a Korean chronic total occlusion study, IVIS guided PCI was performed in a considerable number of 206 patients. However, again, not randomized, but compared in the propensity matching with 201 patients who underwent angiography guidance. This comparison of these two study populations showed that at two years, IVIS guidance had less than thrombosis. So this was significant, zero versus three percent, and they showed a non-significant reduction in MI, one versus four percent, but the overall rate of MACE, so also the target region, lesion revascularization, were similar. This is of course underpowered, and uh, uh, so this difference in stent thrombosis cannot really be taken uh, by face value, but it's uh, look. Uh, pointing in the right direction and uh, is in agreement what we would expect from IVIS guidance, that you really achieve a better lumen and bigger stents are less prone to thrombose. Finally, in a 2015 published study, 230 patients with at least one CTO were then randomly assigned to IVIS or angiography guidance. So that is really a randomized trial. And IVIS showed lower instant late lumen less significantly improvement and lower rate of diameter stenosis. However, there was no corresponding reduction in MACE. Again, small study and IVIS guided stenting of CTOs had, but confirming the other uh, trial, a lower rate of stent thrombosis at two years. Again, underpowered, but pointing in the right direction. So really inspiring us to wait for larger studies to come. This is uh, the angiography uh, guidance. Again, not a randomized study, but a comparison of then 402 patients, IVIS guided or angiography guided PCI. And here also two drug looting stents were compared. We see that at 12 months, there is a reduction in MACE rate in IVIS guidance, and also by IVIS guidance, more often high pressure dilatation was used after stenting to improve the stent expansion. There was also in the IVIS group a larger MLD. The cumulative event rate analysis showed the significant difference. So this is a, a randomized study and the first one that seems to be powered enough also to show this difference uh, in outcome. So I showed you some practical examples in the specific setting of CTO, where you see that IVUS is an indispensable tool. You don't need it in every CTO, but you can use it in many more CTOs than you would expect. And it helps you in the decision-making of the right steps to achieve an optimal result. And we also have promising, although small studies, 
showing that really IVA's use as a routine approach might improve the long-term outcome in these very complex lesions. So thank you very much and I'm expecting and wait for your input and discussion of these information I gave you. Thank you, Professor Werner, for a fascinating presentation. We've had a great response from our audience, so if it's okay with you, we will dive straight into some questions. We have two broad categories of questions, those that are IVUS specific and those that are more about CTO PCI in general. So perhaps we will begin with the IVUS specific CTO questions. So the first question from the audience, Professor Werner, is given all of the advantages you have described, why do you think IVUS use is so low in CTO PCI? Well, there are certainly uh, two main factors. Uh, the, the obvious first factor is that in most of our, our reimbursement systems in Europe, IVUS is an additional cost that is not reimbursed, at least not in the setting of a CTO PCI. I think if <clears> this uh, would be changed, the obvious value uh, would be used much more often. Now we really have to think uh, sh what is the added value? Can we get along without either? That's certainly a bad situation the operator is in. The, se right. second, the second thing is that IVUS uh, use in CTO is not trivial. It's relatively straightforward to use IVUS in a left main situation where you are just looking at sizes and dimensions and the stent. Well, in IVUS, you are analyzing structures of plaque of complete occlusion, and especially also identifying the subintimal space needs training. And I think uh, that uh, there are some deficits uh, among operators who are not familiar with IVUS, and when you are not familiar, you are also hesitant to use it. I absolutely agree. And given those comments that you've just made to us now, do you always use IVUS in every CTO case? I use it in about 60% of my cases. And right, I understand. Uh, okay. Yeah, the same situation where actually I, I really squeeze the money for the IVUS catheter out of the budget. But uh, in this situation, it's added value uh, especially in diffuse disease where IVUS based optimization of the outcome of the result of the stenting uh, is under otherwise I think uh, not done by NGO alone. And I noticed in your presentation you mentioned that sometimes with IVUS guided antigrade cap entry you in fact facilitate an antigrade procedure so maybe you're saving time uh, overall, and thereby potentially having an economic benefit. I, I agree that this is certainly the case. We do not have uh, a really prospective evalu evaluation of this situation, but uh, I, th I think it is uh, a strategy that uh, prevents us from using the retrograde approach in many cases and a retrograde approach is added cost, double microcatheter cost, and so on and so on. Well, I think that is Absolutely. a very great point. And you mentioned the ability to image live is really the most appealing aspect of IVUS in CTO PCI. But do you ever see a role for OCT? Uh, not in the current uh, setting where you are required to do a, a pullback and uh, not able to do the live thing. Uh, OCT has certainly superior imaging resolution, which might be helpful in putting stents and maybe even in the setting of absorb, even though EVS uh, is under debate, even though it certainly has some value in especially young patients. But 
as long as we cannot get the live imaging from uh, OCT, I think uh, this will not have the similar role and will not replace either. Absolutely. And a specific question now regarding the first case you presented to us where IVUS was used in order to facilitate CAP penetration. One of our audience members has inquired what frequency of IVUS was used for this technique. I guess he's, uh, this question relates to the imaging frequency. Uh, Correct, which was, yeah. Uh, 20 megahertz. Or if, <laughs> I'm not sure whether uh, the question relates to how often do we do that, then I would say in, in almost every case uh, of a similar feature that was shown in this angiographic uh, uh, image. Uh, but regarding imaging frequency, which has some bearing on resolution and identification of uh, material uh, that we are targeting, 20 megahertz is the basic uh, imaging frequency that we use here. Because we are well, thank you very the, much for answering. Yeah. Thank you for answering yeah. both questions there, Professor Werner. Very kind of you. Sure. Um, and as we look towards new, potentially newer IVUS applications, do you ever use systems such as those that can co-register the angiogram with the IVUS imaging? I use uh, or I have this system available and I use it occasionally in, in placing stents. But um, in the setting of directing or monitoring uh, the wire uh, procedure and advancement during the CTO, uh, this doesn't work because you need to have uh, an, um, you need to have an imaging, an, angiogra an angiographic imaging, I think. And, and we uh, have another question from the yeah audience here, which is again looking at newer innovations of IVUS, and they have suggested, do you see a role for the new development of forward-looking IVUS catheters? Well, the forward-looking IVUS is new in the sense that it's not available, uh, but it, <laughs> the concept uh, was pursued for, I think, more than 10 years now. I remember the company that um, was developing it originally presenting always the same idea. And theoretically, if the concept works, this is, of course, uh, ideal. I had the privilege of participating in one of the uh, first in man uh, studies with uh, Volcano Phillips uh, in the peripheral setting. and. Um, it seems to be feasible, but the resolution and uh, the real forward penetration was still limited. And I'm not quite sure whether the concept is still uh, pursued, even though it would be uh, conceptually a good addition to our uh, analysis of where should we puncture with our wires. But it's, I think, very difficult to miniaturize uh, for the coronary. Well, thank you for that expert um, opinion on potential developments um, in IVUS technology. Now, if perhaps we could move to more generalized CTO questions from our audience. One of the main questions we've been asked is, what success and complication rates do you discuss with your patients? The success rate that we should offer our patients is certainly a little bit based on the angiographic uh, appearance of the lesion. But in general, we should not treat patients when we anticipate a success rate below 90%. That seems very high, but I think if you even the less versatile operator does uh, 
a, a, a meaningful selection of cases, then even he will filter out patients where he can be very uh, sure and, and confident that he will achieve a success rate of 90%. I, I don't think it's acceptable today uh, to have success rates of 70%. The complication is, of course, in general, not different to a, a regular complex PCI of a rotoplation or so, uh, similar approaches. But we must tell the patient, of course, that we have a specifically higher uh, perforation risk that is documented and that he has uh, uh, to uh, anticipate maybe a pericardial tamponade and a pericardial drain. But in general, the severe complication rate is similar to PCI. Thank you very much. That's very informative. The next question we have is, what is your choice imaging modality for the assessment of viability? And do you think a viability assessment is mandatory pre-CTO PCI? I think that's an important question uh, regarding indication. Uh, we, in general, say that the patient should be symptomatic, even though symptoms are sometimes a little bit deceiving, as CTO patients typically are rather stable, and their main symptom is physical limitation less so than typical angina. But any patient who had a prior MI or he appears on echo with a severe uh, akinesia needs to undergo viability testing before we do a CTO, PCI. Uh, however, there is the poor man's uh, MRI, and MRI, uh, to answer the question, is my preferred choice of uh, imaging. But the poor man's MRI is the EKG. So if we have a posterior, uh, an RCA occlusion, and we have a completely normal EKG in the inferior leads, then I wouldn't go for an MRI because absence of Q-wave is a good viability test. We did a study on that uh, many, many years ago. But in, otherwise, I would advise to do an MRI, a late enhancement scan. Wonderful. So we have true ends of the spectrum in terms of investigation there, from the simple ECG right up to the uh, cardiac MRI. Now, the next question we have from our audience is, do you believe in the practice of bringing patients back for a check angiogram after successful CTO PCI? Well, I, I, would, I would say I believe in the practice, uh, but it is certainly against our current development of guidelines, uh, which is understandable to uh, avoid unnecessary angiography. However, I think if we do really complex cases where we uh, end up with treating uh, patients with long lesions, and often we don't uh, know whether the distal artery is really recovering, remodeling, I think it is, I, I try to get the patients back, not only to learn from my own experience, but also to assess and maybe uh, then uh, un understand that there might be a distal lesion that needs treated treatment, uh, even though the CTO looks good. But it is... Um, I think a practice that's not uh, it's not sanctioned in most of the current uh, reimbursement system. Anyway, I, sh I think one should, with talk with the, uh, one should talk with the patient and uh, uh, make it clear that this is certainly something which has no proven prognostic value. But for each and every operator, it's important because we are so good now in opening arteries, but we have no real idea how good are we.
five years out or 10 years out. Absolutely. And a question which is a hot topic in PCI in general, but what duration of dual antiplatelet therapy do you use for your patients? And do you have any minimal duration? Well, in general, we advise 12 months, and we just give clopidogrel unless it is a stent reocclusion, a chronic stent reocclusion. Then I would give something like ticagrelor. Uh, but other than that, we give clopidogrel and advise for 12 months with a minimum of six months. Thank you. Here we have a general question. Do you have any specifics about the mode of arterial access? And indeed, what sized sheaths would you advise? Uh, that's a very important question, especially uh, in relation to using IVUS. If you use IVUS in the anti-grade approach, you can do it hardly with a, a six French catheter. So you should, in general, use a 7 French. It is more comfortable even, and our Japanese colleagues do regularly use 8 French. But for me, 7 mm. French uh, works well. It, uh, you can put uh, an eagle eye, for example, together with a fine cross microcatheter in a 7 French sheath. Now, our general approach is that we use a radial and femoral axis for the bilateral axis. And we use invariably the slender sheath, which allows to uh, uh, get a seven French sheath in a six French outer uh, radial sheath, the seven and six slender sheath. So we get seven French uh, from the radial to the left system, and uh, seven or eight French to the right from the femoral. That's 90% of our cases are set up like that. Great, that's very helpful, thank you. And our, our last question now, Professor Werner, to those interventionalists that you have uh, inspired from your talk, how can interventionalists that are keen to learn CTO-PCI begin that process? I think you need to, the ideal situation is if you have an operator with decent experience in your own lab, and you hook on, hook, hook up with him, scrap with him, and uh, work together. This is not always the case. And uh, then you need to listen and attend meetings. I must say that, of course, I started CTO when it was not so popular. So my main source of uh, inspiration came by watching cases. And it's very helpful to watch live cases which are uninterrupted uh, because you really see how they drag on. That is one thing of passive um, um, inspiration you get. And I think there are a, a lot of um, workshops around, small group teachings where you can get an interaction in the cath lab one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, operators who are experienced, uh, who give their tips and tricks. And there are a lot of programs, I think, in UK especially, but also here on the continent. Uh, we do a lot of these workshops, and uh, in every language it's available. I think these small group teachings are very important, and then go and start with the basic technique of dual injection and easy cases. And I think the JCTO score, that's a very popular, is a very good discriminatory score to identify the easy lesion that everyone can start with. Great. Well, thank you so much, Professor Werner, for answering our viewers' questions. It's been a real pleasure having you with us today. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for hosting this. Uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. So that was Professor Werner 
speaking to us live from the Klinikum Darmstadt in Germany. You can find out more about Professor Werner in the link below this video. It just remains for me to say thank you, our audience, for joining us today. As ever, we would be very grateful if you could rate this webinar using the star rating system on your screens. If you have enjoyed this learning experience and want to listen to our other webinars, please turn to the Academy section of our website at radcliffecardiology.com forward slash academy forward slash webinars. So that's all from me. Until next time, thank you and goodbye from Radcliffe Cardiology.